Uh, okay, uh, good afternoon to everyone present here as well as people who have joined us online. Um, I hope uh, my voice is audible to people online. Uh, so today, uh, our speaker for the afternoon sessions uh, under talks at ATRI is Dr. Charlie Shackleton, uh, and he's joining us online from South Africa. Uh, so Charlie is a full-time research professor in the Environmental Sciences Department at Rhodes University in Makanda in South Africa. Uh, and he has uh, been there since mid 2000s. Um, he uh, has had a close engagement with ATRI uh, and an extensive experience in NTFP and uh, invasive alien species uh, working on them in South Indian landscapes. Uh, he also occupies a nationally funded research chair in interdisciplinary science in land and natural resource use for sustainable livelihoods. Uh, Charlie has published his work extensively with over 30, 350 journal articles and book chapters, um, as well as 11 edited books, uh, which span uh, some core research interests in NTFP, rural livelihoods and trees in urban spaces. Uh, and he is also an associate editor and on the board of several journals. Uh, he has mentored almost more than 100 PhD and master's students. Uh, so today's topic uh, is also uh, aligns well with ATRI's research interests, core research interests as well. Uh, so we all are looking forward to your talk, Charlie. Uh, over to you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I hope that you can hear me and certainly for the moment see me. Um, we can. Okay, perfect. And I can see some uh, faces in the audience there. So hi there, guys. Um, at least it's fortunate that the timing of this seminar doesn't coincide with any of the IPL or Royal Challengers actually playing. So it, so it, it means you, you, you haven't got the excuse of, of going to watch the cricket, rather you have to watch me. Um, I don't promise to be as entertaining as the IPL, but I, I, I will do my best. Um, so you will have seen in advance of, of the session we're in now that I am going to be talking to you and I'm going to try and, uh, but I'm going to share the screen now, if I may. Um, yeah, pop, 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 pop. Why is it there? Just. Is the uh, slide visible? Yes, it is. Perfect. So I'll be spending the, the next uh, several minutes chatting to you around the topic that was previously advertised, namely the need for an urban ecology of the global south. 
uh, that was what was advertised. Uh, since the advertisement, I've added a bit of a subtitle there um, as a step towards a global urban ecology. And I hope why I've added that subtitle um, or that caveat will become apparent as we go along. Um, I see this not so much as a, as a formal presentation, as it were, but hopefully more of a dialogue and, and an opportunity for me to uh, stimulate some, some conversations and some thoughts amongst ATRI staff and fellows and students um, around the context in which we do our research rather than sharing with you any great theoretical insights or empir empirical results. Just by way of orientating you, so you might have uh, at least some vague understanding of where I'm sitting right now. Um, I'm sitting in a town called Grahamstown, which is marked by the red arrow down there, down in the southeast of South Africa, um, latitude 30, 33 degrees, so opposite hemisphere to you, uh, as, as well as a considerably further distance away from, from the equator. Uh, Grahamstown on this, it's called Grahamstown on this map. Uh, the city did change its name about three years ago. It's now called Makanda um, as part of the process of decolonialization of um, the naming of geographical features in the country. So if you may see, if you've seen any of my recent work, it says Makanda rather than Grahamstown, but it is one and the same. Uh, it's a small town of around about 80,000 people and marked by very strong disparities between uh, rich and poor, which has a strong overlay also with, with, with race in South Africa. <clears throat> and so it, it, it offers some wonderful opportunities to interrogate aspects of urbanization, urban ecology, and compare those to much of the urban ecology literature that we get from the global north. So the conversations that I'm, or the, or the issues that I'm gonna raise during my talk are largely encapsulated in this book that came out uh, in the second half of last year. So it's not even a year old, uh, edited by myself and three colleagues. Uh, Saral Saliers is a professor at Northwest University, which is way up here near Mafeking, Krugersdorp area up in the north of part, northern part of South Africa. And then Elandri Davoran and Mari de Toy were uh, postdoc fellows in our labs respectively. So Elandri was a postdoc with me and Marie was a postdoc with Saral Saliers. And the book is divided into four sections, setting the scene, uh, patterns of processes of urban ecology in the global south, urban ecosystem services. So there's a chapter on provisioning services. There's a chapter on um, regulating services, cultural services, disservices, services and the like. And then the, <coughs> excuse me, the last section deals with planning and management. And then the final chapter, uh, poses or identifies some themes uh, that we think are emanating particularly from global ecology uh, dynamics in the global south that, that we were putting on the table as a way of sort of saying these are things that need to be carried forward towards the development of uh, better understanding of global ecology, of urban ecology in the global south. So clearly what we do need to do before I go too much further in the talk is just cover or, or, or try and say a little bit, well, well, where is the global south? We've got a nice book there that, that says urban ecology of the global south. Well, where is the book focused? Where, what, what sort of parts of the world is it talking about? Well, way back from the 50s, the, the world was divided by what's called the Brandt line. You can see there between the, the red and the blue. Uh, based largely on, on economic criteria. And we recognize that that's no longer applicable. And 80 years later, uh, that the world has changed a great deal since then. So what were then uh, regarded as relatively poor countries, many of them are, are less poor, maybe middle income or even higher than that countries now. 
and that one can then that economics is not the only criterion that one needs to take into account in differentiating uh, the sorts of countries that we are talking about characterize the global south versus countries in the global north. Um, but a key criterion that does come into play or is used frequently is HDI, so countries that have an HDI of less than 0 0.8. Um, nearly all countries in the current dimensions of the global south have experienced colonialism at some stage, some for a relatively short period, some for hundreds of years. And importantly, from a, an ecological perspective, three quarters of the world's global biodiversity hotspots are located in the global south. That doesn't mean we can define the global south on that basis, but it does say, OK, well, as people who are interested in ecological processes and ecological dynamics, that's intimately related to biodiversity. It's important to recognize that uh, we have a large or a disproportionate share of the world's global biodiversity hotspots in the global south. It comprises around about 80% of the global population and around 62% of the world's territory. But you will see right at the top of that slide, I have underlined and italicized the word currently. In other words, we recognize that it's a static concept. We recognize countries will move uh, from one side of the classification to the other. Uh, but nevertheless, it, despite being an imprecise term, it is a term that's sort of gaining traction across a wide variety of disciplines from economics to politics to history. Uh, and now, and not just now, but uh, more laterally, um, also ecology research. So this is roughly what we're talking about in terms of global south, global north, recognizing though it is imprecise and fuzzy. And the second thing also to appreciate, although you know, it is fuzzy, that with such a large proportion of the world's uh, peoples, countries, cultures, languages, there's mu as much variation within the global south as there is between the global south and the global north. But despite that massive variation, there are still, uh, we would argue, several characteristics and dynamics that can be distilled that A, are less evident or weakly represented or totally absent in what we call global north countries. And yet these characteristics and dynamics have are highly pertinent if we wish to understand the ecology of cities and towns within these countries and come up with frameworks uh, and, and management approaches and policies that are going to be applicable in these sorts of contexts. So it has ramifications for sustainability, resilience, equity, human well-being, uh, you name it. So why is there a need for an urban ecology of the global south or for a greater representation of global south knowledge, insights, understanding into a global urban ecology is firstly because as with many other research disciplines, there's a poor representation of the global south contributions in urban ecology publications. That includes both the geography, in other words, where the work was done, and also the scholarship, in other words, who was leading the research. So there may well be uh, work done in a global south country, India, South Africa, Colombia, wherever it may be, um, but it may have been designed and led by uh, institutions in the global north. And so they have particular lenses that they use consciously or unconsciously when they approach their studies within global south countries. <clears throat> and secondly, because we do have this suite of characteristics, which is what most of my talk is going to be about, um, that are common within the global south, but less common with the global north. All right, so in terms of the first question, just to hopefully quickly convince you that there is a, a relative dearth or shortage of urban ecology research in the global south. Um, there's a number of uh, systematic or other types of reviews that have come out in, in the last decade or so on various facets of urban studies. And you can see just scanning across those, what, six different studies 
Um, all of them show that somewhere around about uh, 70 to 80 percent of or even higher of studies emanate either from Global North scholars or from Global North geographic settings. Um, so in the bottom right there, the benefits of urban trees, 74% of them uh, come from the Global North. Um, in terms of sustainability research by Harini Nagendra, who you all know, 70% of that research authorship came from the Global North. And then as a, a very relatively superficial exercise, we admit, but it still uh, backs the argument that the large arrow on the left there is in terms of for the book that we produced last year, we did a quick search in Scopus on urban ecological research in July 2020, and it returned 48, just over 48,000 papers, of which approximately 70% came from authors in the global north. So there's, I don't think there's much argument that we are, the field of urban ecology and various facets embraces um, is, is led by and is dominated, certainly in terms of volume, uh, we, we can argue about in terms of conception and, 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 and what the messages are, but certainly in terms of volume is coming largely from colleagues in the global north. So if that is the case, well, why should we worry? We could say, well, that doesn't matter. You know, the urban ecology is urban ecology and we can just adopt um, insights, understandings, frameworks from the global north and we can either adopt them as they are for our own settings or we can adapt them. <clears throat> and our argument in the book is that's not going to be sufficient because there are a host of different characteristics and dynamics that have very strong bearing on urban ecology. And hence we need to take that context into account. So my, my purpose in this talk is to raise awareness around these sorts of contextual attributes rather than as I've said, share with you any empirical results. And these contextual differences, we, we, we can classify, or we, sorry, group would be a better word than classify into six domains, which I'm going to briefly uh, share different aspects. I'm going to share with you. Uh, so the nature of urbanization, the biophysical context, uh, the, the central role of poverty, um, linked to poverty is also skills ratios. The fifth one is colonial legacies. And the last one is some reflection on local knowledge systems. So those of you that maybe were hoping for some uh, empirical results or some deep insights, um, you can probably skip to the conclusion here uh, and then you can go home and, and, and get ready for the, for the cricket later this afternoon. Um, so. I've shown you the graph in the lower left with the north on the top and the south on the bottom. So there is that argument we need to invert this and let's call the south the north and north the south. Uh, but essentially, we're not looking for that either. We're talking for an amalgamation of urban ecology from the north and the south to give us a, a global urban ecology. But we can't do that until there is greater um, understanding and exposure of ecological dynamics within the towns and cities um, that characterize global south settings. So if you got that message, then I'm really comfortable and, and, and you, you can go and do something more productive with your time. But if you want to stick around, well, then I'm going to spend another uh, 10, 15 minutes just uh, ruminating, as it were, on some of these differences in context between the North and the South. And the first one is nature of urbanization. Uh, those in red, I'm gonna share another couple of slides on. Those not circled in red are just there in name. Um, so we're all familiar with the extremely current high gr urban growth rates. That's due to both in-migration uh, of rural areas and in some countries even uh, depopulation of rural areas, people moving to cities and towns. 
as well as growth, internal growth um, within cities. Um, one of the consequences of these extremely high urban growth rates is urban sprawl. So many new migrants, arrivees in urban areas are finding themselves living under conditions uh, that they probably didn't imagine when they first moved. So they often live in temporary housing on unsecure land, maybe in housing uh, built from scavenged materials rather than formal housing. And that these are sprawling out into areas that are either formal or informal green spaces, but spaces that are currently unoccupied. Linked to these is also the whole notion of informality, informality of the urban land use, but also occupation of land, but also occupation in terms of livelihoods. So increasing numbers of, or not, well, they are increasing in, in some parts, I think of, but very high numbers of people engage their primary livelihood activities within informal se economic sectors, which is very different to the uh, global north. Um, some of this can also be tied up to land invasions. So there might be land that is designated on a, on a land use map. Uh, it might be planned for a particular purpose by the city planning authorities, but people who are desperate for economic opportunities, who are looking for services in associated with towns and cities like education, sanitation, um, health services and the like, uh, they, they invade land without permission, however you want to define permission, as finding a place for themselves to live. Because of the high, and then moving around to the left or, or clockwise, because of the high proportion of migrants, what you also find then is uh, a significant proportion of current urban dwellers still have links to rural areas or still certainly have knowledge and cultural practices that they have brought with them from urban, urban areas. And that has particular uh, ramifications for use of species, use of uh, unoccupied lands in urban areas that many urban planners probably haven't thought of. The extremely high growth rates also, not unsurprisingly, results in constrained supply of basic services in many parts of the global south. So sanitation, uh, clean water, uh, refuse collection, uh, waste management, and these all have spillover effects into the ecology of and in the city. And because of the whole combination of factors, uh, strong ecological knowledge, um, informality of economic sector, you do find that some people either culturally or economically make quite marked use of urban provisioning ecosystem services. And I would argue, well, before I start arguing, um, obviously any one of these uh, seven blocks, we could spend a whole hour having a conversation together as what it means for urban ecology. Uh, I don't have that time here and now, but we could certainly engage uh, in other fora online or by email or the case as we wish. Um, but I would argue that all these seven factors which are interrelated uh, are relatively rare in global North settings of Paris or Toronto or Tokyo, um, that these are certainly more features of global South settings. So just in terms of the growth rates, I've already said we are all well aware that uh, Global South is experiencing massive growth rates. But what many people do not appreciate is the growth rate currently experienced in many Global South cities and towns is higher than was ever experienced in the Global North. And so it's quite understandable that people may look at um, Global South cities and the informality and the lack of service provision and start to look for reasons and say, okay, well, this is poor governance or low skills ratios, whatever the case may be. But uh, I, would, I would argue or I would suggest that had London or Paris or New York experienced the same level of 
in migration and growth over the short period of time that they probably too also would have struggled. One only, can, one only needs to think back to um, issues of water pollution, uh, air pollution in London in the, from the late 1880s well through to the 1920s, also New York. So th these things are not, the, these, um, these pathways, these trajectories are not necessarily unique to the global south, but currently the global south, many areas are certainly being swamped and it becomes very difficult to cope with the rate of urban growth. Second one, which I circled in red was that, oh, we seem to have lost the tail. I don't know. I can't see the set tail. Maybe you can on these plots. Um, marked use of urban provisioning services. So people making use of firewood would be a common one. Uh, collecting fruits within the urban green spaces, uh, traditional medicines and the like. Um, this was from a paper that came out earlier this year where we tried to summarize empirical studies from different parts of the world. And urban areas of the global south, you know, the median proportion of households saying that they did make use of urban provisioning services was around about 67%. And in the global north, the figure was perhaps higher than most people would appreciate, but it's still quite a lot lower than the global south coming in at around about 47%. So around about half as many people again in the global south are making use of provisioning services on a regular basis. Take a breath. Um, moving on to biophysical context, um, I've already mentioned that Global South um, enjoys, uh, but is the custodian of 75% of the world's biodiversity hotspots. This is the fact that we have a lot higher biodiversity in many Global South settings is not a surprise because a lot of the Global South falls within the tropics, of course. Uh, so, the, so that's a, a consequence of geographical location. There's also the legacy of colonial introduction of species that have become invasive. Um, many Global South countries are not grappling with that problem, but some are, and somewhat like my own country, which is enormously biodiverse, has enormous biodiversity, it's a very rich in biodiversity, uh, we are suffering the threat to many species because of invasive species introduced during the colonial period. The third one is urban livestock. Well, I've been lucky enough in the course of my job to, to visit many parts of the world. And I've seen livestock in parts of Asia, parts of Latin America, uh, many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. But as yet, I don't think I've seen a, a cow or a donkey wandering the streets of, of, of Paris or, or towns in the United Kingdom. Mark climatic severity. And lastly, the impacts of ecosystem disservice and geophysical hazards, um, such as earthquakes, floods, mudslides, uh, tornadoes, and the like. Obviously, impact is not just a function, it is a function of both the, the frequency of the event and also the ability to, to, to cope with it or to pre-recognize pre it might come and, and plan accordingly. Um, but these are all a lot higher and important issues in the global south than they are in the global north. Looking to urban livestock, there's just a couple of pictures there just to convince you. you know, say a, a picture is worth a thousand words. On the top right there is a herd of cattle in the capital of Kenya, uh, Nairobi. In the bottom left there, there I got, got that by Google, is some pictures of goats in Guatemala City. And then in the top left, is, is two photos of cattle along the streets and parks in, in, in my own town, Makanda. And the one on the right is particularly pertinent because what you can see there, I don't know, what, four or five cattle in, in, in a public park. Um, but what are they doing in that park? They are obviously foraging in that park. So what does that mean for the provision of green spaces? Uh, what does it mean for nutrient cycling? What does it mean for carbon cycles? Uh, what does it mean for the management of these parks, which are not questions that have ever been raised by 
our, our, our contemporaries in global, in global South areas. And certainly livestock in my own city are a major, uh, what should we say? Uh, I was gonna say stakeholder, but they're a major driver of the composition and productivity of urban parks. Uh, the, the cattle and the goats, there are no goats in that picture, but we have a lot of goats as well, damage urban trees. Uh, they trample and obviously um, consume grass, but in times of drought, then the grass cover gets really low and that's increasing soil erosion. But on the other side, they uh, defecate. So you've got nutrient cycling. People can collect the dung uh, for, for, for use either on their own gardens at home or as a fuel. So these are all dynamics that, that are shaping uh, some of the plant dynamics in our city that just is not comprehended in cities of the global north. Uh, here's a map, a very rough map of uh, the proportion of households urban in red and peri-urban as the second figure uh, from a random household survey uh, done by Schlesinger and colleagues uh, at set for the Dar es Salaam figure. That's a different reference. But you can see across these countries, except for South Africa, that somewhere between around about 20 and 50% uh, and, and, and of urban households are keeping livestock. And by livestock, we're talking largely large stock in this instance. We're talking cattle, uh, pigs, goats, donkeys. Um, if we'd included poultry and or say rabbits and smaller things, well, that, that might be a different uh, picture altogether. Okay, uh, high poverty ratios um, is perhaps probably the, the well, no, I, I won't say that. Um, it, it is also a very common characteristic across Global South settings. Um, that results in vulnerability to economic and uh, environmental stresses. Um, it is both a, 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 a driver of and a consequence of the large informal sector. Uh, it is implicated or drives engagement in urban agriculture in many areas, but recognizing that some people engage in urban agriculture for very different reasons. It's not driven solely by need. It might also be driven by um, recreational uh, pleasures. It might be driven by desire for greater diversity of foods and so on. But there is uh, reasonable evidence that there is certainly a poverty dimension to a large proportion of urban agriculture that takes place. On the left there, significant use of local provisioning ecosystem services. We've already covered that. And playing through from the high poverty ratios is it results in lower tax base and per capita budgets going or flowing to city authorities. That the contributions to the tax base from individual households tends to be quite low unless you have a very dispersed tax base, such as through general sales tax or value added tax, uh, but direct income tax is generally pretty low. So taxes are coming largely from the corporate sector. Um, so these poverty ratios uh, define people's, to some extent, people's needs and uses of the environment and how that then plays out in urban planning and management of green spaces or urban green infrastructure. So just to bring, oh, we didn't, just to bring that home in terms of uh, inequalities, uh, you can see that there's a reasonable correspondence between global high levels of inequality uh, globally uh, with the global south and lower levels of inequality in the global north. If you take the, the countries the 15 countries with the highest levels of inequality, uh, they are all Global South countries. And if you take the 15 countries with the lowest inequalities, uh, they are all, I think there was one exception, but I've got your faces on my side of the screen. But anyhow, at least 14, if not all 15 of them are Global North countries. So inequality currently, and it's going to be there certainly for the rest of my lifetime and probably for the next two or three generations at least, is very marked in the global south. What does that mean for urban ecology? And in terms of the informal sector, 
ILO statistics from a few years ago, uh, the proportion of the national workforce in the informal sector were excluding agriculture is around about 85% within Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, two thirds in Asian Arab states, um, almost two thirds in Latin America, as compared to around about 20%, one in five in Europe and North America. So informality, again, is a, is a stark feature. I'm not judging it as to saying that's a positive or a negative, I'm just saying it is. And therefore we need to be considering what that means for ecological dynamics and socio-ecological systems in our towns and cities. All right, moving on to low skills ratios. Um, we're probably familiar with that, again, from the literature, maybe your own experiences, but what that means is there's limited planning and design capacity uh, to manage biodiversity. There's uh, perhaps less monitoring of enviro environmental conditions that, that we would like. Um, it certainly pushes it over into the NGO sector rather than government sector. Uh, there's insufficient waste management and pollution management. And maybe we could, this last one on the top left is, it, it, I can think of some countries that, are, that, 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 that would be an exception, but overall we're saying limited participation in urban governance because people lack the skills to engage in certain facets of that. Of that. Uh, but I do recognize, obviously, engendering participation doesn't, uh, one doesn't need an entry card. You don't have to have a certain skills level or a certain educational level to participate and have a voice. Um, limited planning and design capacity. Uh, we've done work in South Africa in which we've uh, interviewed and interact and workshopped with uh, city planners or with city managers responsible for urban green spaces. Uh, and we were quite, um, it is a value judgment, but disappointed at the, the skills level uh, of certainly of those responsible for managing urban green spaces. Most of them did not have any formal qualifications in such. And um, if they did have a formal qualification, it was in a discipline that had no relation to ecology, conservation, uh, park management, it might be related to disaster risk management or social services or the like. And so when we asked them what their visions were for their city, um, inclusion of, of sustainability and green infrastructure were, were rarely mentioned as facets that they would like to see their city um, working towards or including in the next 30 years. Knowledge and belief systems, um, we would also argue are somewhat different or maybe more diverse, probably a bit of both in the global south and the global north. Uh, I've already observed that there's a high proportion of people who still have links to very real links, links or have spent part of their life in rural areas. So they come with particular cultural and ecological knowledge. Um, a high diversity of belief systems because of a lot of different people coming into the cities. And lastly, uh, perhaps more intimate biocultural relationships with biodiversity in the city. And in that regard, we can think very, uh, we're thinking along the lines of um, in some parts of the world, there are uh, belief systems or cosmologies that um, imbue all natural beings, um, plants, animals, and maybe some inanim inanimate objects as well, uh, with spirits, with, 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 with um, also the, the, that have influence on one's daily life or the outcomes, the, the mishaps or the, or the positives that come out from a particular daily experience. Um, so in the part of the, the world I live, um, the indigenous people are of the Kosa tribe and they are very, the, their, their belief system 
is very reverent of, of ancestors and spirits, and those ancestors and spirits reside both in water and also in natural areas. So that puts a whole new um, lens on uh, cultural services that are needed within the city, but also how people engage with what they will do in green spaces or not do, and how they accept certain management and plans for it, but also their needs, their very innate need to have contact with nature, uh, which is very different to the literature from the global north, where the bulk of the literature is talking about sort of recreational cultural services. People go there for physical uh, well-being. Increasingly, we recognize it also as mental and psychological well-being, but it's not tied through to that spiritual dimension of the belief systems that you find in parts of of Africa, Asia, uh, and, and, and South America. Lastly, I think it is, yes, it is, uh, colonial legacies. I've mentioned introduction of alien species, and I know uh, many of you at ATRI are working on alien species, uh, both in the global north and the global south. We need to be doing more work in urban areas. Uh, inequalities and inequities uh, can be very clearly traced back to the legacy of colonialism in many areas. And then the circled on, in red on the left is damaged or suppressed by a cultural re relationships. So I've just on the last previous slide spoken about these biocultural relationships. Uh, but what you do find in many parts of the global south is that Western colonialism actively suppress these belief systems. So there are laws both mandated through, through government regulations, but also imposed through, through churches uh, that actively said, well, it's, it, it, it's wrong or it's illegal to worship um, other systems or have other relationships, believe in ancestors and to practice uh, some sort of spiritual activities in urban green spaces. And this is only being exposed and coming out, uh, certainly within, within my own country, literally within the last 10 years. Um, and some of these regulations are still, some of these laws are still on the books, uh, these colonial legacies that, that, that need to move uh, and uh, thereby allow people to have and feel and and express their relationships with nature in a way they would like to. So the final chapter of the book um, identifies or, and has a paragraph on each one, a, a number of, of, of themes that we believe are important for uh, future urban ecology research, uh, hopefully both in the global north and the global south, but as I'm arguing, as a way of coming towards a more global urban ecology. And these relate to rapid change. We argue that it seems to come from the different chapters in the book that the cities and towns of the global south are undergoing rapid change, rapid change in migration, rapid change in economies, rapid change in governance at a pace that's uh, a lot greater than in the global north. And so what does that mean in terms of we as researchers trying to guide that change, trying to look uh, at, at, at pathways towards sustainability. Second is this whole notion of informality. Well, it's not a notion, this reality of informality in livelihoods, in use of space, uh, often in governance even, um, which is very different to the global north. And how do we take our ecology forward? How do we understand the ecology? Uh, when we bring informality into the picture. Vulnerability, vulnerability because of the low economic base, vulnerability because people are new to the urban space, vulnerability because of biophysical hazards, <coughs> disservices. What does that mean? Connectivity, connectivity between people, culturally, between rural and urban, between migrants, between the economic sector and not, between... Um, governance systems and institutions and, and people living in, in their suburbs and neighborhoods. Um, what is this connectivity and how does it change? What drives it? How does it morph? 
weak planning and implementation, I think that's a given, that's a context in which we're going to have to uh, seek solutions to environmental problems, as well as understand ecological dynamic dynamics. Um, and then on the other side, environmental justice, uh, stemming from both inequalities, colonial legacies, uh, and informality uh, related to, 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 to land use and, and, and economics. Context matters. Well, hopefully, I think uh, I've managed to persuade you. That's what the bulk of my, my time has been on. That the context in the global south is, is generally very different to that of the global north, and we need to take that more explicitly into account. Partnerships and local knowledge, colonialism and invasive species. I think I've touched on all those, even though touch is, is, is the real word. But I hope overall, oops, we need to go back one, uh, that I have given you some food for thought uh, to go back to your desk, go back to your homes, go back to your field sites and your projects and, and think about some of these things more explicitly. Um, it's been wonderful talking to you again. So thank you. And Dan Yavad. Thank you so much, Charlie. Uh, very, very interesting talk. Um, do anyone... Does anyone have any? Are you still there? Hi, uh, I'm Sri Ranjani. Yeah. From I have a couple of questions. Am I, I, I only agreed to spare, spend this time this afternoon, provided all the questions would be easy ones. So if it's a difficult question, don't ask them of me, I'm afraid. I'll try not to make it a Spanish inquisition. <laughs> Uh, so just a couple of them. First one, uh, when you were talking about green infrastructure in the global south and that there are there's very little mention of green infrastructure in a lot of planning uh, meetings, I was wondering if it has only to do with economic costs related to green infrastructure or what other reasons could be behind this. And my second question was related to the, uh, the income inequality that you had mentioned, the disparity between the global north and the south. I didn't exactly understand what you meant by the income inequality in slide okay. 19, I guess. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, well, I'll start with the second one first, as it were. So by income inequality, we're, we are referring to a marked disparity between uh, income in, in, in income levels between the rich and the poor. Um, so poor people in urban areas of the global south frequently are surviving, surviving at or well below the poverty line in terms of income. Uh, so often they have to maybe engage in, in activities that don't earn cash income but they have to generate income through, through gardening, you know, urban agriculture, or collecting resources or the like. In comparison, there's a very small proportion who have very high incomes. Right, I and these disparities uh, have, have ramifications for, for institutional stability, for political stability even. Uh, when you have a, a mass of people if we could crudely, and I don't mean to do it that way, but crudely label them as the have-nots uh, and a small proportion of those who enjoy a, a significant proportion of the wealth. Okay. Um, in terms of your first question, is I, I think there's, if I understood the question correctly, that the, there's, there's probably multiple reasons, but I think firstly, why isn't the urban green infrastructure more embedded and recognized or acknowledged in, in, in plans in the global south is you and I and, and colleagues, we need to be putting more information and more motivation on the table. So part of it is, is, is the absence of information. Um, so it's the next generation of, of urban ecologists who, who are going to be able to address that. Second, the second reason is, I, I think, 
and, and there is literature to this to this regard, is that urban planners see urban green space as a cost. Right. So they have to budget in their city budget. They need to allocate X millions to, to have vehicles to drive out. So they have to buy the vehicles. They have to buy the fuel. They have to pay the labor to drive out and either create the green space or maintain it by trimming the trees, mowing the grass, picking up the litter, whatever the case may be. They may have to uh, breed, breed tree stock, which they go and plant. So they see it as a cost. And it is, it's a direct cost. You can't do those things without cash. Uh, but they don't as yet see the benefit. They, they, they appreciate the benefits of being able to take their relatives out and, and have a picnic or walk or jog, but they don't cost those benefits. Um, and I don't know now, there must be dozens of cost-benefit analysis of green spaces, unfortunately, mostly from the global north, um, which showing the, you know, the, 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 the benefits outweigh the costs by, set by I've, I've seen ratios of sort of the, the lowest of around about three up to somewhere around about 20 times. And most of those studies that quantify the benefits don't even quantify all of them. So if you take the whole suite of benefits, um, then I think we've got an argument to city, we, we've got a case to advocate to city planners and authorities for green spaces. And one way I'm trying to do that in my own country, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying successful because I've only started doing it fairly recently, is we have high inequality, very high poverty levels in South Africa. In South Africa. Um, and so urban green space, yes, is way down the list, is I'm starting to engage with city authorities saying, it's see it as an investment in poverty alleviation. You have all these other poverty alleviation strategies, building houses, uh, giving tax rebate, rebates on certain things, allowing a certain proportion of, of electricity per month to be free. So they have a whole suite of poverty alleviation strategies. Um, and I'm saying, but why can't you think about green space as well? Because green space provides fruits. It saves visits to the clinic if people are physically or mentally uh, well-being, feeling better. Um, so I've put out a couple of pieces recently on the links between sort of urban green space and poverty. We'll see if it works, but I'll probably be retired before I'll see the benefits or, or otherwise of, of this of this approach. I hope that answers your question. It does. It does. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> thanks for the presentation and also the details of the book that you just uh, have completed. Uh, I think I wanted to highlight a few things. I'm Renan from Atri. Uh, one thing about uh, the colonial legacies, which probably you might have written about, but I couldn't, you know, figure out in the presentation was also um, how colonial legacies came in as, you know, creating infrastructural settlements as differentiated settlements, such as you had the white town and the black town, the native town and settler town, such kind of infrastructural segregation also probably continues till this day, and which in turn, you know, creates infrastructures of disadvantages or advantages, depending on where you're located which then further, you know, affects your land use, further than affects, you know, um, your ecology and also affects, you know, who gets to occupy what space. Also highlighting the inequality that you mentioned. And second thing, I think uh, this, uh, the informality part was quite interesting because a lot of studies on informality in the Global South have pointed out how, inform how formality is seen as this pedestal or this desired space or the end goal. But we need to flip it and, you know, work with how informality itself can be a lens to explore uh, relationships in the Global South. Yeah, thanks. I think you said it better than I did. Uh, I, perfect. Yes, I, fu I fully agree. And then the next time I'm invited to lecture, I'll ask you to do it instead. Uh, you, you, you phrased it a lot better than I did. If, if I can, just anecdotally, um, so I totally agree with, with your comments. In terms of this uh, colonial legacy, um, 
So there is is the se the segregation of spaces, um, but there's also species that are either revered, introduced, grown, and so on. Is in South Africa, the government started quite a long time ago, two decades, probably even more, uh, what they call a champion trees program, and it's it's recognition and labeling of trees nationally that have some significance and then they get special protection status so if a, a building development wanted to happen where there's a champion tree the answer is it won't be allowed um, but what are the criteria for champion tree, trees and if you look at the criteria well it's trees of significance which includes historical significance um, but largely it's due to size it is big trees, really dominating, beautiful, phenomenal trees that are massive in, 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 and we're a semi-arid country. And you know, they're, just, they're just wonderful. Everyone has to fall in love with, with, with those trees. But the problem is in, South, in, in our country, the indigenous species very rarely, except for yellowwoods or podocops, get to any large size. So if you look at the inventory of champion trees, uh, I can't remember the percentage. I, I could look it up and tell you, but it's certainly close to 70 or 80 percent of the champion trees that have now got this special protection status are introduced species. So we are not celebrating as champion trees our own indigenous species. And, and you know, this is embedded in the whole government program. Um, to say so, if size is the main criterion, it's going to disqualify our indigenous species. And we've got 1,700 indigenous species of trees. Um, so, we'd re I'd really like to see that changed and, and let's start celebrating um, some of our indigenous species. But this is a colonial legacy. Yeah, just an, just an anecdote. <laughs> Hi, Charlie. How are you? This is Sidapa here. Sidapa, my friend. Are you well? <laughs> Thank you very much. Wonderful talk, uh, Charlie. It was nice to Thank listen you. To and also see you. So what I was thinking, you know, the basically the, you know, um, our developing uh, countries, especially that uh, are due to the rapid uh, urbanization, there are so many the villages that uh, rural areas will get engulfed by the cities. And they basically, uh, otherwise, they used to depend on forest resources or NTFPs, NF NTFPs, and all those things. And that kind of a resource use and the impact on those resources and the knowledge um, the community has on that, uh, so due to the urbanization, uh, that the knowledge and the resource use and the livelihood uh, loss and all those things need to be captured. I think somewhere it is. Kind of missing that information that's what i was thinking i don't know i missed to listen that i i don't know that's what i was thinking charlie mm. Mm. yes well as, as 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 you know i've also spent most of my life working in rural areas and and, and in villages um so, so i'm well aware of, of of what what you are um highlighting here um i i'm, I'm not sure that I, I, I would think the the migration of okay. of the youth in particular from rural villages to towns is, is perhaps a bigger a bigger eroding a, a driver of erosion of knowledge than it is of towns expanding and engulfing cities um, so cities engulfing a uh, what were rural villages? Um, I, I think there's there's a far greater loss of of local ecological knowledge because there's a generational shift to urban areas. Um, yeah, but in if we do go down to that spatial dynamic, you're talking about the expansion of urban areas engulfing um, rural villages, which happens. Uh, I, I'm not sure what we can do about it. At, uh, accept, argue, plead, prove 
with city planners to ensure, make sure that whilst the city is moving outwards, that there is sufficient um, urban green space for people's needs. And that's recreational needs, it's, 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 it's uh, livelihood needs, and sufficient opportunities for people to interact with nature um, in, in the various ways that, that people would like to interact with nature. If it's, if it's urban sprawl, if it's informal, well, then a lot of these spaces are going to be threatened just by the sheer volume of people seeking a place for, 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 to put up a home. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, <clears throat> Charlie, I have a small question. Uh, about the funding that uh, is received for urban ecology research. And uh, do you think that is one of the big limitations in why the Global South is underrepresented when it comes to urban ecology? Like, what are your perspectives on how likely is a funder in the Global North uh, to sort of give money in the form of aid to uh, to people or organizations in the global south who want to actually study urban areas where it's assumed that you know there'll there'll be lower biodiversity or human nature interactions in these urban hotspots are probably not as significant uh, in order to be studied for for any change to occur so how what are your perspectives on this limitation Thank you, um, an interesting question. I, <laughs> speechless. Um, look, my, my sense, every, every funder has its, has its portfolio of interest areas, you know? So if, 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 if a funder really wants to fund researchers or, de or, or, or development programs or management programs around, I don't know, the, 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 the biodiversity and conservation of a particular wild space or a particular species, um, we're not going to persuade them to now say, well, won't you offer some of your funding to um, urban green infrastructure? I don't think it's gonna happen. But that said, I don't think there's a shortage of funding for this sort of work. Um, everyone's aware, both in the global north and the global south, that we, we are faced with massive urbanization. Um, and what, so you've got strong funders, people looking for collaboration on ecological research, say in, in, in one or two global north countries, paired with one or two global South countries. So that comparative type of work. They're also well aware, uh, development funders are well aware that, um, that the locus of poverty um, and its attendant challenges is moving from rural into urban. Um, 30 years ago, Poverty was largely, not solely, but largely a rural phenomenon. That's no longer the case. So they're well aware of that. So I think there is, there is funding um, to, particularly if you can make these links of, uh, around poverty, general sustainability, and this whole process of urbanization. Uh, I, th I think it's there. But if you uh, email me after this session and say, Charlie, can I suggest some funders? The answer is no, I, no, I can't. Um, but in the calls I see, um, there, there's certainly funders interested in urbanization processes and, and sustainability, in ge general sustainability. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. I guess there are no more questions from the audience. Uh, <laughs> so we would just like to thank you for uh, this very insightful talk. And uh, we are very glad there was no electricity cut from your side and we could hear you speak. Uh, so, yes, thank you so much, Charlie. Not at all. Thank you very much. And it was nice to be in a tree, even if not in person. And hopefully it, it won't be too long before I'm there in person.
So okay. enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, I'm still here at lunchtime, so I've got to do some more work still before I'm allowed to go home. <laughs> All right. Okay. Have a good day. Cheers then. Bye. Bye. Uh -huh.